spent a lot of my time training my therapist and training and, and speaking about this so that women know that there's hope. Women know that they are whole, perfect, and complete exactly as they are, and they just need a little bit of support. What if there are things we never had the opportunity to learn? We've all been to school or training, but there are things they never taught us that actually make a powerful difference in life. I'm here to share with you all the pieces you've been missing, mindset, health, success, and more, and we'll all learn together from guests along the way. We may not have learned it the traditional way, but oh my goodness, let's keep learning how to do things differently. OMG, hello, my friends. Today's episode is very focused on women's health, and I am excited to be able to talk about this with my guest today. Pelvic health is something that is gradually being talked about a little bit more, particularly in the podcast world, I would say, but it's still something that many of us, and I might raise my hand on this one, including me, really, are not always totally comfortable discussing. And at the same time, this is pretty life-changing in terms of importance. So my guest today is gonna help me out of my comfort zone and help you with a lot of great information. So Hannah Ross is a highly passionate holistic leadership coach, women's health advocate, and host of the She Has the Audacity podcast. And I have shared an episode of that because I was her guest as well as the clinic director and pelvic health physiotherapist at Vital Physiotherapy and Wellness. She's a leading women's health and pelvic health physiotherapy clinic in Toronto. Hannah is dedicated to empowering her team, colleagues, and clients through coaching, mentoring, and education. She is renowned for her expertise in pelvic health, prenatal preparation, and the realities of parenthood. And she's a sought-after educator and speaker who inspires her clients to take charge of their health and lifestyle. She is really a true champion for high-achieving women. So I am so excited to have you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. We're going to uh, create some safety for you around the topic of pelvic health. <laughs> yes, and I don't mean to make a big deal about that, but really, it's. I guess the point is, it's something that we don't all sit around and talk about, right? So yeah. it's important to do that. I mean, we don't talk about it. And also, you know, there, it's so interesting because we've normalized it as something that you should just shut up about. Like, don't, don't, don't talk about it. It's kind of our, you know, pretend this isn't happening and just smile and act like everything's okay is sort of our norm. Agreed. And yep. uh, I think we deserve a lot more than that. I think we do too. So let's, mm-hmm. let's dig in. Here we go. Well, first of all, tell us, because I think people's stories are powerful. How did you end up working in this field related to pelvic health and working with women? All right. So I feel like just like all of us sort of get to where we are because of our own personal experiences, I'm no different. So I'm actually a mother of four. And after I had, I'm, I'm like a lifelong, like, exerciser and movement, like passionate mover of my body. And uh, after I had my second daughter, I was very into P90X. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that. It was a, back in the day when we had DVD series, I had really bought into the idea that after you have a baby, you need to get your body back. That was like a primary concern for me was getting my body back and acting like I had never had a baby. I was experiencing all of these symptoms. I was having pain with sex. I had low back pain. I had hip pain. Um, And, you know, I would talk with friends and they would be like, oh, well, just like have a glass of wine. And, you know, what did you expect? You just had a baby. (laughs) I was very into this P90X and P90X had one, it was a DVD series and you did, they had different exercises on each DVD and they had a calendar of how you were supposed to follow those DVDs. And one of them was called plyometrics, which is like high intensity jumping type exercises. And one of the exercises that they had you do was called a rock star jump. And in the rock star jump, you got to embody your inner rock star and you would hold your guitar in one hand and strum it with the other. And while you were jumping up in the air and kicking your feet uh, to your bum, just like a rock star would. And every time I landed, I peed my pants. Mm. And I was like, hmm, something's not right here. And I went to my doctor and I love my doctor. She's very well intentioned. She covers all the bases. She sent me for an internal ultrasound 
And guess what? Everything looked normal. And she told me everything was fine, but I really did not feel fine. And I think that the more that I speak to clients, the more they speak to my to, to women, this is literally the experience that they have. They're told, what did you expect? You had a baby. Or what did yeah. you expect? You're going to perimenopause. Or what did you expect? You, you're postmenopause. This is what our bodies do. But, you know, women's bodies fall apart. Just have a glass of wine, just throw on a pad and go on with your life and pretend like it's not happening. Just like we talked about earlier. Don't talk to people about it. Just smile and act like everything is perfect. As long as you look on the outside, like everything is fine, be really, really thin and get your body back. Even if it's not functioning on the inside, just shut up about it. And I think that my my doctor, I really think she didn't have the resources to, she didn't know what to do. Right. And at this time, I was um, working as a physiotherapist in a in an orthopedic clinic. We were working with people with back pain and neck pain and sports injuries. And one of my one of my friends at the clinic, one of my physio friends, was getting trained in this area called pelvic floor physiotherapy. And this was my my daughter. Now my second daughter is thirteen years old. So this is twelve years ago. And she was telling me all about it. And what is a pelvic floor physiotherapist? A pelvic floor physiotherapist or a pelvic health physiotherapist is a physiotherapist who has extensive background orthopedic knowledge. We know we're trained like any other, but we have a special designation to be able to perform internal vaginal and rectal assessments to assess the pelvic floor muscles. Mm. Think about pelvic floor muscles. We think about Kegels, right? When you think yeah. that's all we've ever been told is just a Kegel. Right, these muscles are important for continence, for um, you know, making sure you're not leaking urine or feces or gas when you don't want to be. They're really important for healthy sexual function. They're really important for pumping the blood from your lower extremity up to your heart. They're important as part of our core, like when postpartum um, or later on in life, our core is actually made up of our breathing muscles, our inner abs, our pelvic floor muscles, and our low back muscles. There's like this canister inside, um, and they work as a system, and nobody talks about it. And so when we're, you know, when people are saying like, I don't feel like I don't have my abs back, it's, well, we got to start really, really internally. And nobody knew, nobody talked to me about this. And so she was like, you know, Hannah, you should, you should come in. I'm going to assess you and I'm going to, I'm telling you, I'm going to help you. And I was like, your fingers are going nowhere near me. Get your fingers away from me. <laughs> <laughs> the idea to me was so absurd. Like, what do you mean you're going to train my vagina? Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Yada, yada, yada. She convinced me to come in. And when I say it changed my life, I literally mean it changed my perception of myself. I, I went in and I really acknowledge now, and I see this with so, so many clients and women that I work with. I genuinely felt my, I thought my body was broken. I was looking around to everybody else. I'm like, I must have done something wrong. They all have it figured out. Why am I the only one who's leaking? Turns out, Nobody else is talking about it, but they were all experiencing symptoms too. I was the proactive one who was searching for answers and who was open to having the conversations, but everybody else is, they're suffering in silence actually. Yes. And so I recognized that I suddenly, I was totally disconnected from my body. I now felt like I was truly strong from the inside out. And at that time, I also was starting to really get, I wasn't, I didn't want to treat people's shoulders and elbows anymore. Like it really wasn't a passion of mine. You know, somebody sitting, I don't want to talk about ergonomics of your desk anymore. And I know that there are a lot of physios who want to do that and I totally support them and I love them for it, but it no longer spoke to me. And I re was really, really thinking about going to medical school or something else to truly change people's lives. And this not only changed my own perception of self and my experience in my body, it actually changed the entire trajectory of my career because I started to talk to people about this. I got trained. I wanted to help people. And yes, the first couple of conversations I had with people was like, you do what? Like the same conversation I had with my physio and my friend, right? And then like people would be coming out of the woodworks like, oh, you're leaking when you pee? You should go talk to Hannah. And I was working at a clinic at the time and I was working in, I was working in a, in schools, helping kids who had, you know, physical issues. I had actually three jobs at the time. And I would also in my spare time do this like side gig where I bought a massage table and I would drive around seeing people in their homes. Mm. It's just a thing that was my passion project. And it's slowly, I had to start to quit these other jobs because slowly, like it turns out there are a lot of people who are experiencing this and who feel very, very broken, very disconnected from themselves and their bodies. They feel like they're, they feel like they're never going to be whole again. And it turns out that all we need is a little bit of support, a little bit of guidance. And 
we are stronger than we ever thought possible. And I started traveling. I quit all my other jobs eventually. And I was traveling around. And I know I had a lot of road rage because I was my, my, <laughs> you know, like I had three young kids at the time because by the way, I got pregnant again and I had another child and I would drop my kids off at school, go drive around all day and see clients, come pick my kids up, take them to our extracurriculars, give them dinner, put them to sleep and then go out again to go see a more clients. Wow. And it got to a point where I was like, all right, I need to, I need to find a place because I need people to come to me because the time driving from place to place was taking up too much time. And I decided to, so I rented a space and then my day got, I would arrive there at eight, eight o'clock. I'd see clients till seven. I suddenly had to have other people pick up my kids. And I was like, there's a lot of people who need help. So I made my first hire. And all of a sudden, not only did I have a business, but I was, now I was an employer. Right. Started, you know, and as we started to help more and more people, I had to move out of being in the business. I do see clients once a week still. I spent a lot of my time training my therapists and training and, and speaking about this so that women know that there's hope. Women know that they are whole, perfect, and complete exactly as they are. And they just need a little bit of support. And I really, really, you know, as I started to grow this business, then, you know, as the as the owner, people would think that like I'm I'm the best, which at this point, like I see clients less than my other physios. But I started, I really attract the type A perfectionist, high achieving type of woman. And I really started to understand this is not only about the pelvic floor muscles. The pelvic floor muscles, they engage very deeply with our nervous system. And Mm -hmm. if your nervous system is fried, you're just going to be like, this is just your body's tell that you're leaking, right? Or you have urgency. You feel like you're going from zero to 100 when you you have to go to the bathroom or you're the type of person who knows where every bathroom is everywhere, or you're on Zoom calls all day or in meetings. And in between every single meeting, you have to rush to the bathroom. Guess what? That is your body's response to what's happening in your nervous system. And so I started to talk about the nervous system and we treat now from a biopsychosocial model of care, which means your biology, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments interact constantly with your psychology and the social determinants of health, of health, you know, your, your network, all the other social determinants of health. And we had to go big picture because teaching somebody to Kegel or see, teaching somebody to actually relax their pelvic floor, which is what we do more often than teaching them to Kegel. It's not enough because if, if their cup is full and their only way of maintaining control is to grip everything in their body just to keep on keeping on, we need to give that nervous system capacity. Yeah. Wow. So that's an amazing story. And if you saw me, listeners, half the time my mouth was hanging open as she was saying various <laughs> things. <laughs> so I'll just tell you that since you can't see me. So many things in there. First of all, I fully agree. Our own stories are always powerful, as I said before, and tend to be kind of how we end up getting to something that we really love to do because we had to deal with it ourselves and we had to figure it out ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I know so deeply that feeling that the clients come in with feeling so broken. Yeah, absolutely. And second of all, two things struck me, and this is the point where my mouth was hanging open, because... If you're a woman who has had a baby or babies or who is in midlife, I feel like you haven't escaped from having some sort of issue related to pelvic health. And so we're going to talk about that. But I did not realize that the pelvic muscles were involved in blood flow, like you mentioned, Mm -hmm. and that it was part of the core. I do bar class. I work on my core. I'm really, I feel like that's really important. And I had no idea, none. So that was kind of a revelation. Yeah. Love it. And I mean, there's actually one more more role that I didn't t- tell you about, but and that's particularly important later on in life is that these pelvic floor muscles actually hold up your inner organs. So they hold up your bladder, your rectum, and your uterus. And what we start to see, you know, in around 50s, 60s, we start to, start to see a lot of clients who are being told that they need hysterectomies and bladder lift surgeries. Uh-huh. And uh, these muscles are really important for supporting those organs. And those surgeries have close to a 50% failure rate. So we would never send anybody for a knee surgery without prehab and rehab. And yet we're doing that so much with a lot of the women's health surgeries that are happening. Wow. Wow. Okay. So everything you've said so far makes me realize that in doing one podcast episode, we're not going to be able to deal with all of these issues, (laughs) but we're going to try to hit some big ones. So let's start with this. You've already mentioned some of these things, but I just want to make sure we kind of 
put it together in a way that listeners can easily identify with. So what are some of the most common issues that women face related to pelvic health and that listeners might recognize? Okay. So, I mean, let's start with like a little, a little anatomy. Okay. So if you take your hands, listeners, if you're driving, do this after and you put your hands on your hips, that top hip bone, that's actually the top of your pelvis. And if you're sitting right now, you're sitting on two bones, your sits bones. That's, those are the bottom of your pelvis. So the pelvic floor muscles span from the front of the pelvis, which is where your mons pubis is, um, which is where the hair is usually um, on top of your vulva. And they go all the way at the back to your coccyx, your tailbone. And if you're looking ex- externally where your tailbone is, that's the top of your bum crack. And they go side to side from those one sits bone to another, okay? And they're literally like a bowl of muscles. And there's three layers. There's an outer layer, a middle layer, and a deep layer. And within the female pelvic floor, there's three orifices. There's an orifice for urine, an an orifice, which is your vagina, and an orifice for your anus and where your stool comes out of, okay? Now, these three layers have five major roles. Role number one is kind of what we talked about, holding in your urine, holding in your gas, holding in your your feces. Anything that, um, anytime that you lose urine, when you're not sitting on a toilet, is an indication that your pelvic floor muscles need some TLC. I don't care if you have a, you just had four coffees, you're jumping on a trampoline, your best friend just said the funniest thing in the world to you, and your kid comes and pushes you from, from behind. These muscles are designed to keep you continent at all times. So if you're noticing that you leak when you cough or sneeze or jump, or that sometimes your urge to pee is so strong, you don't quite make it to the washroom, that is a sign that your pelvic floor muscles need some TLC. Likewise, something like frequency, where you're like a frequent flyer of the bathroom, right? We want people to be urinating about five to eight times a day, including mm-hmm. these things, okay? And, and if you're going more often than that, that's a sign that you can really benefit from pelvic floor physio. The other piece that is really, really important here is that urgency that we sort of touched on. That over time, like your bladder is a muscle too, and it just just fill throughout the day. It has a, a very deep relationship with the pelvic floor. And when that bladder fills, it, send, it sends a message to the brain. It says, I'm full. You should be able to walk to the washroom slowly and calmly, sit down in the toilet, and release your urine. And if that you if your, br- your brain only goes from, we got to go right now, there's no like slow, gentle, oh, you start to notice your bladder's a little full. Okay, I'll be okay. And then it fills up, and then you can gently, you know, walk slowly to the washroom. If that sign that your bladder is full is goes from like that zero to 100, where it's like, go now or you're not going to make it, that is also a sign. And these are things that we've normalized, right? Yeah. Oh, I have a small bladder. I really, truly thought I had a small bladder. Well, guess what? We see clients all the time who think they have a small bladder. We get them urinate. Like we, tr- we can train their bladders to urinate five to eight times a day. And we've done nothing to change their anatomy. Right. So right. These are these are things that we've just been told over time that aren't necessarily true that just minimize our experiences and then it limits our ability to actually function well because we think there's nothing we can do. But likewise, just the same way that we should be able to hold in our urine and stool, we should be able to release it. So if you're somebody who poos really infrequently, if we can't, those muscles should be able to hold in grip and hold in the urine, but we also have to be able to relax and allow out that urine and, and stool. So if you're somebody who feels like you you pee and you stand up and you still think you're full and you have to sit mm-hmm. down, that's a sign these muscles are not relaxing properly. So okay. urinary retention, right? Symptoms, people who think that they always have a, a, um, a UTI, but they're testing negative, that's a pelvic floor issue very often. So wow. there's a lot of pieces around, um, around stool and urine. We like to talk about poo and pee a lot. I like to say, you know, the start of your dig- digestive system is your mouth but it actually ends in your pelvic floor. It ends in your anus. So if you're doing all the things like, you know, you're, you're drinking all the water and you're eating all the fiber and you're still having issues with bowel movements or a, a gas or, or stomach pains, it's time to look at your pelvic floor because the door is closed. It's not coming out. So that is really interesting because I have interviewed a naturopathic doctor on the podcast and we talked about gut health. That was our topic. And she was saying, you know, it's so important that we're eliminating every day and that a lot of people aren't. And she was talking about what we need to be eating and and all of that, which is powerful. Yes. However, I never realized that there could be another issue. Yes. So we work very closely with naturopaths as well, especially because we work with clients in and around like times in their lives where hormones are changing, right? Like 
perimenopause, postpartum, like postpartum, we consider a mini menopause, right? And Mm -hmm. so there are things we can actually optimize with our hormones, optimize with our foods and use food to heal ourselves. And these things work really well synergistically. Interesting. Have you ever heard of the upper limit problem? We have a belief in our minds that there is a certain amount of success and happiness that we can have. And when we start to get close to that, boy, are we going to self-sabotage. And that might be negative self-talk. It might be not doing what we know we should do. So many things. If this is something that you find you struggle with, you're your own worst enemy, then I have a curated series of podcast episodes for you. So grab them for free at bit.ly slash empowered self-talk and you'll learn how to grow that upper limit as well as speak kindly to yourself while doing so. So uh, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about, so there, so job number one is that, that continence piece, right? But then there's also sexual health and people do not want to talk about this, okay? Correct. Um, the muscles in our pelvic floor we really only think about them in terms of Kegels. Kegeling is a contraction of the muscles. It's like doing a bicep curl. Yes. All we're told all the time is just curl more, curl more, curl more, curl more. But that minimizes what what the role is of a muscle. A muscle would benefit from being strong. Sure, we want it to be strong. But it also has to be flexible. It also has to have endurance. It also has to be coordinated with its synergistic muscles. So when you're training for a marathon, you don't just keep bringing your knee your knee up to your chest, like your 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 you know, in order to train to run, we we step forward. We also step back. We also have to cross train. We train the in, inner and outer thighs. We strengthen the rest of the of the body, right? And yes. so when we simplify this as just Kegel, all we're doing is teaching somebody to contract their pelvic floor. Most of the women that I work with actually get a gold star on their chart when it comes to contracting their pelvic floor. What they don't know how to do is actually how to relax it. What they don't know how to do is turn it on at the right time. If I have a really strong pelvic floor, but I sneeze and then it turns on, I'm still going to leak. Strengthening that muscle is not going to help. We have to train it to turn on at the right time. We also have to train it to work with those other core muscles that we talked about because they actually work synergistically. So we don't train the pelvic floor without actually training the breathing diaphragm. We don't train the pelvic floor without training training the innermost abdominal muscles and the back muscles. It's a system. So training just the pelvic floor is like training a finger and wanting to work on grip strength. We train the whole hands together. The other piece here is that when it comes to sexual health, if those muscles are weak, if they're not strong enough, you're going to have a lack of sensation with, with penetration and an inability to orgasm or a lack of sensation with any sexual activity. If these muscles are on too much, we actually start to see pain with penetration, pain with sexual activity, and also inability to orgasm. And we've normalized so much that that women don't have to orgasm every sexual encounter. And if you don't want to, that's totally up to you. And that's what, you know, you and your partner. However, if you're having sex with a man, he's going to be, he's going to be orgasming every single time. And yet if these muscles aren't working well, then you're not orgasming if you have weak muscles and you're not orgasming if you have tight muscles. And yet we assume that it's because of they're too weak. So then we go on to strengthen more. But if you are somebody who has not been assessed by pelvic floor physio and your muscles are too tight, you're actually making this things worse. Mm. And most people don't Kegel properly. We actually have different areas of our pelvic floor, the front, the middle, the back. And many clients of ours are really, really tight at the back and weak at the front. And they have to learn how to relax one part and strengthen the other and have them work all together. And so... There's so we're so quick to be disheartened by what's happening um, in our bodies, and if we just had that little bit of insight, I always say a pelvic floor muscle assessment should be the most empowering thing that you do. Wow. We want you to understand what's happening with your body. I'm not going to fix it for you. I'm going to give you insight. And I'm going to help you strategize so that you can go and fix it, so that you can take control of your body and know that again, you are not broken. Yeah. You know, as you were saying, well, first of all, that was just a massive ton of information. So thank you. <laughs> Second of all, it just made me realize more and more that we we do let this be sort of shrouded in mystery. And maybe part of it is that, like, as you're saying, Kegels, I think probably every woman knows what that is. But 
now I'm thinking, do I really know? Like front, middle, back? Like, I don't know. And it's not like the bicep, right? Where like I can tighten my bicep and do an exercise and I can feel it and I can see it. I know exactly where the muscle is. Yes. This is like a mystery inside that we don't know. And there are a lot of biofeedback um, um, devices now that you can like actually insert vaginally and you can contract and you can relax. Now, some of them will let you know if your if your muscles are too contracted, there are some more advanced, I would I will say, devices that will give you insight and say like, oh, go see a pelvic floor physio. But if, for example, if your pelvic floor is already contracted and you insert one of those devices so that you can strengthen your pelvic floor, quote unquote, and your bicep is already contracted and you're trying to contract more, those devices will actually tell you that you're weak because an already contracted muscle cannot contract anymore, right? It's not going through full range of motion. Yeah. So- Having um, an assessment done by a well-trained pelvic floor physio is really, really valuable. Yeah, good point. Good point. And oh, I, I'm like, I'm trying to decide which way I want to go with my questions because there's so many places to take that. Is this now a field where, let's say, our listeners are not located in Toronto; they're located all over the place, a lot in the U.S., a lot in the U.K., Canada, and other places. Is this a field now where there are more and more people who are well trained that maybe would be, you know, within our reach to find them? And and how would we look? So more and more all the time. Um, I will say, like even within, I'm in Toronto, Canada, and I actually I run a mastermind for pelvic floor clinic owners because to get trained in pelvic floor physio for, in most places, it's a weekend course. Mm. So there's really a difference between somebody who dabbles in this and someone who does this all the time. The clinic that I, I run, this is all we do. So we, for example, have um, online programs for people all around the world. And those are really great for many people, but some people just really need that one-on-one -on -one assessment. And so in the different areas of the world, there are different governing bodies and there's different programs that, that train the pelvic floor physios. And so my recommendation is to look at the different uh, colleges. Like we, we've got the Ontario College of Physiotherapists in, in Toronto or in Canada. Um, different all the different provinces have their different governing bodies. But to be honest with you, a lot of what we do, a lot of what my team does is um, I say we're like the traffic cops, you know, like the people will contact us where, where do you, who do you recommend? And we'll send them our recommendations based on where they live. And there's the, in the U S there's the American physical therapy association. I forget what you call it. Yes. Physical uh, therapy. Yes. Yeah. And, um, they have a section on women's health there. Great. And so people can search there. You can search by, um, your zip codes. Um, and internationally, there's within, you know, it's a, it is a fairly small, small community still. So many of us know different places, you know, there's a lot of great teachers teaching in different areas. Um, and so a lot of us know the different, our, 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 our friends who are, who are deep in this work as well. And so I will say it's a growing field. And also you want to speak to somebody who has had experience. So uh, word of mouth is always the most important. You know, I, 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 it's okay to try somebody you find off of Google, but if you know someone who's done pelvic floor physio and has had an amazing experience, go see the person that they've seen. Yeah. Uh, tried and true yeah. is important. Well, you know what? Doesn't that mean that we should just be talking about this more as we're doing now? There you go. So it's, it's a theme. <laughs> so, okay. So let me come back to more advice. I just, I just wanted to put that out there because I feel like maybe people are listening and they're thinking, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Oh, what do I do? That's me. People can always reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll navigate that with you. Love it. And I'm going to ask you to, to give all that information in a little bit for sure. Love it. And of course, now I'm looking at the time, but we're not stopping yet. We are going to keep going for a little bit. So when you said that a lot of us have issues related to relaxing these muscles. So I do an exercise to fall asleep at night where I kind of work my way from my feet all the way up my body, relaxing my muscles. Is this something where we can kind of learn to relax our pelvic muscles and and feel that in the same way that we feel you know relaxing our legs or whatever it is a hundred percent now one of the things i'm not going to say it's working against you but one of the things we have to overcome initially when we're when we're working with the pelvic floor is that so many of us just want to ignore this area of our body right it's yes they're muscles like any other 
However, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of pieces to this where there, there is shame involved for many people. There's years and years and years of social conditioning to just, you know, ignore this area. It's shameful. Don't think about it. And what that does is in our brain, there's something called a homunculus, which is a representation of every area of our, of our body. And if we ignore the area, it's really much harder for our brain to connect with that, with those muscles. Mm. And so a lot of what we do initially is actually just learning to connect to that area of our body, learning to find it. Going to some of our clients, they can't kegel because their brain doesn't even like it, it's just hard to find, right? They're just like, ignore this and move on with my life. So, learning to relax, we use a lot of visual cues so that we can start to learn to connect to that area. And when we're using the visual cues, often in clinic, I'll assess somebody internally and we'll try a couple of different, we do it with breath, different visualizations on the inhale and see which one actually produces a relaxation of those muscles. So naturally, when our core is working well, when we take a diaphragmatic breath, our diaphragm is sort of an upside down U-shaped muscle that sits at the bottom of our ribs. Mm -hmm. And it's actually part of our um, cardiorespiratory system. So when you take a breath in, it actually contracts down into a U-shape and it allows your lungs to take in more air. So it creates more space in your lung capacity. And as you exhale, it springs back up into that upside down U-shape. Now, this core that we talked about, the diaphragm at the top, the pelvic floor at the bottom, the inner abs at the front, and the inner back muscles at the back, that is not only our stabilizing system, it's actually our pressure system as well. And so as you take a breath in, that diaphragm pushes down, but this is a closed pressure system. So what happens is as you breathe in, all of your internal abdominal organs, your stomach, your spleen, your kidneys, your um, your intestines, they actually all push down. And in a well-functioning system, it pushes into the pelvic floor and allows the pelvic floor to relax. The pelvic floor receives that pressure. And as you uh -huh. exhale, the diaphragm springs back up and the pelvic floor should gently engage naturally, like without ever having to think about kegeling, kegeling, kegeling. When we're training a Kegel, we're training, strengthening these muscles. This is one of the first places that we, we do train it. We train it on the exhale. But before we ever start that, we actually start to get into alignment, bring your ribs over your pelvis and taking a, focusing on that inhale, allowing those muscles to relax. relax. And one of the first um, visualizations we give both to clients who are learning how to relax their pelvic floors. And we also teach this to our prenatal clients in preparation for birth around week 34 and on is to do 10 breaths. We slow them down. So they ideally want them to be a four to six second inhale. So that might take a couple of breaths for you to get to that slower pace. And as you're inhaling, you're actually visualizing a flower blooming down and out of your vagina or your anus. Yes, we have a lot of fun in pelvic floor physio. The <laughs> such a great visual. Okay, continue. <laughs> the flower bloom is actually the most normal. Like they get, they get uh, you know, more wax <laughs> as they go. But a Kegel, when you think about a Kegel, a Kegel is actually a contraction. And so it's a closure and a lift of these muscles. And so when we're trying to train relaxation, which should happen on the inhale naturally, we're thinking of that flower bloom is a downward, is a downward visualization and then a widening of that flower. So we're just training that, we're visualizing that relaxation. And we encourage our clients to do about 10 of those a couple of times a day. I like to say every time you go to the bathroom, especially for my frequent flyers. But the idea is that throughout the day, we're starting, you know, you start off being like, I don't know if this is working and what's happening. And then we'll often get like emails, you know, three days later, like, I felt it. I know what's happening now. And we start to build that connection. I love it. And I, I'm going to say listeners, just rewind a couple minutes and listen to that again. Because I think that that you explained it well. And that's something people could try now and just see if they notice anything, see if they notice a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of the thing where like, practice does make perfect. Um, most people feel like they're quote unquote doing it wrong initially because it does feel really hard. Your brain is just not used to paying attention to this area. And so it feels like you're like functioning in space, right? And the repetition starts to cue your brain to pay attention to this area and start, you start to notice the difference between relaxation and contraction. Yeah, I see that because as you described kind of where the pelvic floor muscles were, I also was thinking I, I, I didn't realize the 
where, the location, the size, how major it is. So we need to learn how to make that connection mentally for sure. Yeah. Most of us really just think hold in our pee when we think Kegels. And that is just a very specific front area. And it's so much more than that. Yeah. Really valuable. Really valuable. Now I'm going to ask you another question uh, that probably has a long, long, long answer. And I'm going to ask you if we can do it in a fairly short way. So let's see how it goes. So we were going to talk about mindset, but something you said earlier that is certainly related closely to mindset was the nervous system. So I want to see if we can get a little bit better sense of, we. I did do a, an episode on the nervous system and how we need to relax our nervous system in order to, goodness, do so many things in life. We were talking about weight loss at that point, but tell us a little bit more about what you mean that this is so related to the nervous system. So I want you to think about like the times that you've felt quote unquote stressed. Most, we know that there are actually two muscle groups that respond to the, to stress. And when I say stress, you know, historically that was you know, we, we go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn um, when we were running away from a tiger, right? When there was like a real imminent danger. And we live in a very, very fast-paced society right now. And when I ask my clients if they're stressed, most of them will be like, nope, because they think that when I say stress, I mean 150% stress. We don't even recognize that most of us are living in the go, 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 go. We really value ourselves um, as human doings. And not as human beings. And we really don't value taking the time to just be. And so, you know, I, I, one of the physiological repercussions of that is that a lot of us walk around with neck pain and pelvic floor symptoms. Because when we're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, when we're running away from a tiger, there's actually a signal that goes directly to the pelvic floor that says, turn on, clench. Mm-hmm. Because when you're away from a tiger, it really doesn't make sense to just stop and have a slow, gentle bowel movement and allow <laughs> stool to come out and not to push, right? It doesn't make sense to just hop into the bush and have a quickie with your honey, right? <laughs> There's real physiological reasons why it makes sense for us to, like, these no law, these were not the most important things you needed to run for your life, but that that neural connectivity still exists. So when we are in that go, 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 go mentality, I don't care how much you can learn to flower bloom that pelvic floor. If your cup is absolutely full, it just takes one more drop to have it spill over. You are constantly going into this compensatory response, which is to cleanse your pelvic floor, to not allow it to function as it needs to. We need to give our system capacity. We need capacity in our nervous system to not constantly go into this response where we're clenching our traps and we're clenching our pelvic floor. Wow. I tried to make it really quick for you. You did a great job. That, I mean, we could have a whole episode on this clearly, but I wanted to make sure that we could at least touch on that because the issue of the nervous system is woven through so much of what we talk about in terms of life coaching and women's health and and mindset. It's because this is our body directing how we're functioning, how we're thinking, how we're everything. So I wanted to make sure we made that connection and and so thank you for that. Okay. I'm just, I'm just thinking, let's see. So I love the exercise that you gave us. I love that we've made all this connection kind of between mind and body. Is there anything else that someone who has been listening to this and kind of recognizing themselves in some of the things you've talked about, some of the symptoms, is there anything else that they could start doing now that might be a helpful thing? Yeah. The, I mean, the number one thing I have my clients start to do is just start to notice start to notice your self-talk, start to notice what I call frenzy mode. So much of us are just in that go, 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 do, 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 list, 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 list. And when we start something new, we inherently go into a state of like this, we're doing it wrong. Something wrong with me. I'm never going to be successful. I can never do this. We have, we come from a perspective of I'm either good at it or I'm bad at it. And we haven't really learned how to be crappy in order to be good. Right. I get that completely. Fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And one of the, because this area of our body is really something we've never thought about, it's really something we've never paid attention to, it is going to be hard at the beginning. And one of the things that I love, love, love to do for my clients is I I always tell them like, listen, when we are done, you are going to be an advocate for pelvic health. You're going to like, this is going to change your life and you're going to want to tell everybody about it. 
please don't tell people how much work goes into it. <laughs> and the work is not hard. Like I, we integrate the homework into, into their day. I'm not saying go do this for 45 minutes, but it's work that at first is like drip, 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 drip. It's a slow- Pun intended. Yeah, I know. Pun intended. Yeah, seriously. And it, fe- and it, it feels so woo woo. People are like, okay, I'm going to breathe. And then what? When am I going to get into the, I want to get into the planks. I want to get into, and I'm like, no, like we really get to create balance and our brain is not used to the being part. And so we just think we're doing it wrong because we're used to going hard and going fast and going strong. And in order to bring balance to our lives, to our public health and to really our mental health, it does require slowing the F down, which is what I tell each of my clients. Otherwise you're not going to be successful. Doing this hard and fast is the opposite of what your body needs. And it feels really uncomfortable. Such a great way to wrap that up. Thank you. Everything really is related. And that being said, I want to make sure to give you a chance to tell people where to find you because we've scratched the surface here. And I feel like I'm leaving listeners going, well, wait, what do I do if I have this problem? I have that problem. What do I do? So we have our exercise to start relaxing, which is a great first step, but how can people connect with you uh, and and find you in general? So you can find me uh, on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at uh, Hannah Ross PT, which is spelled C-H-A-N-A-R-O-S-S, as in Sam, PT. Um, Or you can find me at Vital Physiotherapy and Wellness. And we have incredible offerings happening right now. We are launching our Leakless Method, which is our six-week program to become leak-free. It is a virtual online program. We are literally going to teach you everything that you need to know aside from having a one-on-one in-clinic experience. It's all the education. We're just going to build so much on everything we just touched upon today. And what we know is that nobody knows anything about the pelvic floor. And I really believe that this, our leakless method is what every single woman deserves to know. And it's not hard. You just have to be willing to try. And they can find that on your website then. Or on our, or on our, our uh, Instagram. Most of our stuff is just tagged in our Instagram as well. Perfect, 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 because I know people will want that for sure. Awesome. Well, let me not forget to ask you the last question, okay, which is probably not nearly as important as everything we've been talking about, but I need to add a song to the nostalgia playlist. Mm-hmm. And so tell me a song that just brings with it good memories for you or makes you feel nostalgic. Oh, okay. Just coming to mind right now is Sweet Caroline. Love it. Yes. Um, like- um, you know, every time that comes on, we all, everybody puts their Link's arms and we all sing it together. And it's just like such a positive, happy song for me. I love it. I don't have that on there yet. And I'm just kind of swaying as we're talking about it. So yeah, absolutely great. There you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to sing, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much. This really is going to be impactful for a lot of women. I know that it is. And I, that's just a powerful thing for both of us to be able to go out into the world and do. And so listeners reach out to her, find out more information. And I I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I am so glad that we talked about this topic. That is not something that we hear about, we think about, well, maybe we think about all the time, but we don't necessarily talk about in general conversation. So I hope this was so helpful for you listeners. And if you are listening to this before June 20th and 21st, make sure to go hit the show notes, take a look at the link for the masterclass coming up on June 20th. It's lunchtime for most of us. And I want to help you stop being your own worst enemy. You can also go to www.omgteachme.com slash coaching. And I can't wait to see you there. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. OMG, did you know that we have mini episodes every Friday as well? Make sure to follow OMG Teach Me in your favorite podcast app so you get all the goodies. And if you're just finding this podcast and you're kind of wondering where to start, I have a curated mini series for you to help you stop self-sabotaging because we all do it. So head over to www.omgteachme.com and 
and sign up when you get the pop-up box. We may not have learned all these things in school, but they sure are powerful now.